Live. Brought to you from the Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. It seemed to be ages since we've been together. It dawned on me that some of us don't understand that we have a very human life by our baptism, by our confirmation. We're in the year now of the Holy Spirit. We have to, as Catholics, as Christians, live a supernatural life. And so I would just like you tonight, before your phone calls, is to take with you tonight difficult parables. I can't take all of them, but there are a few <clears throat> that we don't understand. Well, let's look at a couple here. I think I got them marked right. Um, one is the parable of the laborers. Now see, the reason I'm bringing these up is because we have to think the way God thinks. See, if I hate my brother, that's not how God thinks. If you lie or cheat, that's not how God is. If you have a hot temper, if you're proud, arrogant, if you find it hard to forgive and forget, it's not like God. So what does that mean? It means you're not acting like God. You know, it's foolish to think that you're going to die and pop boom, right into heaven when you hate half the people there. <laughs> you know, you stay in hell, you still hate your mother-in-law, you still hate, may she rest in peace, but you hope she doesn't. <laughs> All these people you don't even like when you're under the impression that death suddenly takes all that away, bang, there you are enjoying the awesome holiness of God. Now, what does that mean? You've got to be purified. And most of us live rather imperfect lives. Why? Because we don't think like God. Not that we have to think infinite thought. We're not. We're finite. And the best of us, well, we don't measure up to God, but we need to make the effort. I'm going to go through some of these parables, a couple you'll understand. I think this one you're going to say, yeah, I don't like that one. That's why I'm taking it, because you don't like it. <laughs> but you have to understand this is how God thinks. See, so many of you have hatred for people and this for years over some silly, silly thing. Silly thing. You know, it's been a long time since I said this, and some of you have heard it. Many of you have not. And I think one of the silly things that happened, I want to share with you. A woman came to me one time, and... Um, she had to pray for her two daughters because they hadn't spoken to each other for two 
years. How do you like that, huh? Haven't spoken to each other for two years. I said, wow, something terrible must have happened. I said, well, what happened? And she said, well, my mother was very wealthy and she died. She left half to one and the other half to the other. Hey, what's wrong with that? I said, and why they haven't broken? They got half and half. Well, they're arguing over a commode. <laughs> I said, no, what? <laughs> she said, they're arguing over a commode. I said, you mean a commode, commode? <laughs> she said, yeah, a commode, commode. She said, you don't understand. I said, no, I don't. <laughs> She said, it's an inlaid commode. I said, oh, wow. <laughs> an inlaid commode. I mean, that has to be kind of special, you know? She said, but you know, one thought she should have it, the other thought she should have it. I said, well, you go and tell them, Mother Angelica said, they should take turns putting their head in it. <laughs> Can you imagine going to hell and somebody comes up to you and say, what are you in for? <laughs> and you say, well, I got in here over a commode. Oh. Now you see, hatred is a terrible thing. And when we do not act like God, when we don't act like God, you can't be happy, number one. Number two, we're miserable. And number three, we run great risks. Obviously, we're not growing in holiness. We're not growing in goodness. We're not growing in love or joy, or compassion, or selflessness, all of these beautiful virtues that our Lord died for that we would have grace to practice, see? Just flitters out the window. <clears throat> so, this parable, I think, is one we don't understand. And why? You know, on many of you who have not been to confession for years, I'll make a bet it's on nothing. You're ashamed. There's nothing you could tell a priest he hasn't heard before. You don't want him to know who you are. Go to another city. Go to another state. Who's going to know who you are? God knows who you are. So all of these things that we're so afraid of, people's opinion, it doesn't mean anything. You know what our dear Lord said about other people's opinion? The opinion of men mean nothing to me. I always wondered how the liberals are going to interpret that inclusive language. <laughs> they wouldn't dare say the opinion of women don't mean anything to me. It must be the opinions of people, whatever it is. Opinion made nothing to him. Why? Because we vacillate, we operate from a lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding, and many times a lack of love. Now here's the parable. <clears throat> he said the kingdom of heaven, now we're talking about going to heaven, right? The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner going out at daybreak to hire workers. Well, he made an agreement with the workers for one denarii a day. Okay? That a lot of money? Well, it wasn't then, but it was, it was according to how they lived. So, <clears throat> and he sent them to his vineyard. Well, going out about the third hour, he saw others standing around, don't have a job. And you can go to any city today. In certain sections of the city, there are people just standing there, 
especially construction people. When we built this monastery, we went to those places and got a truck and filled the truck up with these men and they dug ditches, they poured concrete. They didn't have any job. So this man going around and he sees some more standing there and he said, look, you go in my vineyards, I'll give you a fair wage. Now, that is a problem, isn't it, huh? <clears throat> because in our human mind, we would reason, well, the, at least he told the first one that he's going to give him a denarii. And they said, oh, wow. And these people, he didn't say that to. He's just a fair wage. Now, <clears throat> I would have thought if I started half a day, I'd get half a denarii. But if I'm hungry, I'll take it. And that's how these men felt. So they went about the sixth hour, and again, the ninth hour, he did the same. So now, early dawn, the third hour, the sixth hour, and the ninth hour. I mean, way getting towards dark. Now, at the eleventh hour, he went out and he found more men standing around. Ooh. And he said, why are you standing here idle all day? And they said, because no one hired us. He said, well, you go to my vineyard. Now, he didn't even tell him what they were going to get. He didn't say fair wage. He didn't say anything. But say it would be a half of a half of a denarii, better than nothing. These men were humble. Today you couldn't say that. They say, well, now let's hear it. Wait a minute. What am I going to get? Do I have a coffee break? At the 11th hour, you want a coffee break. Do I have a 10 minute rest? They, we ask all these kind of questions because we're not so interested in the work as we are the benefits. Aren't we interested in benefits, huh? Well, now, here comes the difference between God and you and I. He said, call the workers and pay their wages. Hmm. <clears throat> now, starting with the last, okay, they work maybe an hour. What's an hour? He gave them one denarii. They worked one hour. I hear what you're saying. Unfair, 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 unjust. Now, when the first came, they expected more. They said, oh, wow, they got a denarii. I bet we get five. They grumbled at the landowner. Now remember, the landowner is Jesus. And they said, the man who came last said, have done only one hour, and you treated them the same as us. Though they have not done a heavy day's work in all this heat, I bet there's not one in this room who wouldn't think the same. You don't want to say it, but I'll make a bet. You think the same. And he said to them, my friend, I am not being unjust to you. Did you not agree on one denarii? <coughs> Take your earnings and go. I choose to pay the last comer as much as I pay you. Oh, labor unions wouldn't be very happy with that, would they, huh? Wouldn't they raise a fuss? He said, have I no right to do what I like with my own? Why be envious, jealous because I'm generous? Now, what is the real story with this parable? You know, and say, for example, a child dies, 
at six, six years old. Go straight to heaven. Wonderful. Somebody else dies at 85. Goes to purgatory. And then goes to heaven. Isn't that a similar thing, huh? You say, hey, wait a minute. By golly, I got the same degree of glory as this kid. But that's what the Lord says, you see. The sinner can go to heaven. Maybe not straight to heaven. They have to be purified. But the greatest sinner can go to heaven. And the most innocent child goes to heaven. There's not a high heaven and a low heaven. There is heaven. They have greater degrees or lesser degrees of holiness. But they're in heaven. They both got the denarii. The one had to live till her 85 and the other six. But they both went to heaven, you see? God's mercy follows us, follows us everywhere in our lives. You say, well, this child didn't, didn't do anything. They didn't have a temptation, didn't have all the problems, didn't have to make a living, didn't have to worry about gas, electric, telephone, didn't have to do anything. And that child's in heaven, yes. <clears throat> and this 85-year-old woman in heaven, yeah. Degrees of glory different. One suffered more, perhaps. And maybe that 85-year-old just bucked the Lord so long. And maybe she got the same degree of glory as the six-year-old. Because we don't use the opportunities God gives us to be holy. Like this parable, we don't think like God. We don't think like God. And that's the beauty of, of, of our religious life, but that's also the beauty of your daily life. Well, now we're going to take something that <clears throat> most people understand, another parable here, about the unforgiving debtor. He said, the kingdom of heaven is, may be compared to a king who decided to settle his accounts with his servants. And when reckoning began, there was a man who owed him 10,000 talents. You know how much that is? Let's see, what does it say here? Nine million dollars. You can't even count that many zeros. Nine, can you imagine carrying that load around you all day long? I owe the master $9 million. But he had no means to pay. You wonder what he did with it, don't you? He must have lived it up. <clears throat> sure, the master gave orders that he should be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions to meet the debt. At this, the servant threw himself down at his master's feet, and he begged him, oh, give me time. How many people will give loans say that? You know, they hear that every day. Give me time, give me time. And I will pay you the whole sum. Well, the master felt sorry for him. Then he let him go, and what did he do? He canceled the debt. <gasps> Can you imagine your joy if you owed somebody nine million dollars? And he felt so sorry for you. And he said, oh, forget it. Oh. <laughs> I dropped it right there. <laughs> now the servant, now we're going to see how God thinks so different than we do. The servant went out, and he saw somebody that owed him a hundred denarii. You know how much that is? Fifteen dollars. Fifteen miserable dollars. Here's somebody who owed nine million. 
Here's somebody over fifteen million dollars. No, fifteen dollars. Excuse me. Ugh. Nine million to fifteen dollars. A nothing. Absolute nothing. And what does he do though? Well, he said, "Pay what you owe me." And his fellow servant. Now, this, to see this, a fellow servant. Here we have the master forgiving the debt of a servant. Now we have a servant owing another servant. And he says, pay what you owe. And he says, give me time and I will pay you. But he would not agree. He had him thrown into prison until he paid the debt. His fellow servants were deeply distressed when they saw what happened. They went to their master and reported this affair. And the master said, you wicked servant, I canceled your debt. And you appealed to me. Were you not bound then to have pity on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? Oh, now you see the point? When you offend God, that's a pretty big thing. So if you've been forgiven unbelievable sins, hidden sin, you think nobody knows, I bet they do. That backyard fence holds many a story. And the telephone sizzles all day long. In this day of communication, my friends, you can't hide a thing. If their neighbor doesn't know it, your faith shows it. That's pretty clever, isn't it? If your neighbor doesn't know it, your faith shows it. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> because, do you ever look at yourself in the mirror after you've been on a drunk? Are you telling me you can go downtown and nobody knows? Oh. You look dissipated. You got bags under your eyes. You can hardly see. You're still walking like this. Somebody asks a question, you have no idea what he said, and you have no idea how to answer. You're in a fog. Are you kidding? Nobody knows? Oh, yeah. They may not say anything, but they know. And what did it say here? Now, he said in his anger, the master handed him over to the torturers till he should pay his debt. That reminds you of purgatory, doesn't it? Handing you over to the torturers until you pay your debt. And now here's the clincher. You know, every parable has a clincher. And this is how my heavenly Father will deal with you unless you forgive your brother. How? From your heart. From your heart. If you demand from your brother, and that demand gets bigger and bigger and greater and greater, well, I can guarantee the Lord will treat you the same way. And so we wonder sometimes why it is. That parable is difficult for us many times because we got the same problem. We do have the same. You tell me somebody that maybe did something to you 20 years ago and in your heart you haven't forgiven yet. But see, because we don't think of God, <clears throat> because we don't understand that I have to be, before I get to heaven, I have to be like my Father in heaven. I have to think like he thinks. I have to be like this master who forgave generously, most generously, 
And that's what sin does, you know? Sin divorces us from God until we pay. We have to pay. Some people pay for everlasting punishment because they will not ask forgiveness. And some people pay in purgatory because they never use this life to cleanse their souls. You know, I look upon every difficulty. I try. Don't they always make it? But I try to make every difficulty an opportunity. Some difficulties make you humble. Some make you forgive, which makes it pleasing to God. Our dear Lord himself said on the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Have you ever said that to your neighbor when you forgave them? See? So we have to understand that when our dear Lord forgave, he forgave a lot more than you're ever asked to forgive. One sin. Whoa. One mortal sin. What would have happened if some of you who are not converted, living good holy lives. What would have happened to you if our Lord, if our Lord took you in a state of grievous sin? You know where you'd be? It's a geographic thing we got for Christmas, National Geographic, our program on um, volcanoes. tell you, all this fire just came out of that mountain from way down, poured out, red fire. Well, that gave us all a good idea. You say, oh, mother, for goodness sake, you're pre-Vatican. <sighs> Look, sweetheart, hell is hell for you in the past. And all you pre-Vatican people, and all you pro-Vatican people, all you people before Vatican II, and all you people after Vatican II, if you don't shape up, down you go. <laughs> now, you may not believe it, but I hate to have you find out by going there. See, you, you got to face realities. There is a heaven. There is a judgment, there is a, a hell, there's a purgatory, there's a particular judgment when you die, there's a general judgment at the end of the world. Now that judgment doesn't change your status. It just tells everybody why you went, where you went, or how you got there. Unfair, unfair. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, all of us are going to be lucky we got there. Why? Because all of us did or do things that's not right. And our dear Lord one day had about enough from all these people. And what did he do? Well, you look at St. John's Gospel. And he went to the temple and he found people selling cattle and sheep and pigeons. Well, what's wrong with that? You had to have these animals to make sacrifice. And you had to, people came from all over parts of the East or the world, whatever was known at that time. And they had to, they had to exchange money like you do in an airport. So. There they were, selling cattle, sheep, pigeons, and money changers sitting there. What did Jesus do? He made a whip out of cord. You know how long it took him to make that whip? It wasn't straight. It must have taken at least a few hours to make that whip. Woo! -hoo. And what happened? He drove all of them. He took a whip and boy, he started pow. 
<laughs> and he drove them out of the temple, the cattle, the sheep. He scattered all the money. The money changers coins, he knocked over their tables. And he said to the pigeons, so he had mercy on the pigeons. He said, take all this out of here. Stop turning my father's house to a market. Then his disciples remembered what the father said in scripture. Zeal for your house has devoured me. <sighs> now, some of us have gone and chosen the wrong path. Sometimes it's our fault, sometimes it's not our fault. Whatever it is, I ask you now, the beginning of a new year, not only to repent and go to confession, but to determine. You're not only going to live a good life, you're going to live a holy life. A holy life. You're going to try and think about Jesus. You're going to try and, when the opportunity comes to forgive, forgive readily. When the opportunity to show compassion to your neighbor, do it for Jesus. Do it like Jesus. When the opportunity comes in the darkness of faith, we don't see the end of the tunnel. Put your trust in Jesus. Say, Jesus, I don't see the end of this tunnel, but I trust in you. I trust in you. See, all these things that happen to all of us all day long are only opportunities from God to purify us, purify us. See, we don't know the time when God will call us. We have to be ready every moment. And if we goofed up a little bit, we got to, boom, say we're sorry, repent, go to confession, and start all over again. Then when we meet the Lord, he will say to us, you, know, you have done well. Enter into my kingdom. It's like the, the brides, you know, 10 were very, very fervent and they had oil in their lamp and they had oil, extra oil. Well, here were 10 that didn't, they had oil in their lamps, but no extra oil. Now, the bridegroom is coming and those who had just the oil in their lamp all went out. They said, give me some of your oil. And they said, hey, we can't lest we too ran out. Now, the first thought in your mind is, they're uncharitable. Why didn't they share, right? I know what you're thinking. I thought the same thing. But see, when we die, my friends, when the bridegroom calls you and me, there's no more time to get oil. You've had five years, 10 years, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. You got to repent. You got to go ahead of time and put oil in that lamp. So I, I hope, hope I gave you a little, a little sample of sometimes the parables in the scripture we don't understand. But they're all created, given to us by the Lord to make us understand in our daily lives. Some things seem unfair, but God permits them for me to grow in holiness. See? We have a call. Hello? Oh, hi, Mother. Hi. Where are, you? Where, are you, where are you from? I'm from the Scranton area. Wonderful. What is your question? Oh, uh, you, you were talking about hatred at the beginning of your program. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, well, I have a situation that, that I, I work with a fellow at, at work that's not a very good situation at all. There's a lot of hate between both of us. Mm -hmm. I try to rectify the situation. I try, I try to go up to him and apologize to him, but he's not the type of person that, that accepts apologies. He's mm. sort of uh, cold-hearted. 
I, I pray a lot, and, 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 he, and I keep him in my prayers every morning. I ask God to help both of us, yeah. to, you know, try to help us uh, rectify the situation. But he, he still has doesn't want anything to do with it. And uh, do I, you I, work together or just the same? We work together. We work. We work in the same department. We work in an industrial plant. Yeah. And, and we do work in the same department, and it's mm -hmm. it's not a good situation at all. And, and yeah. At times, I feel like it, it may even become physical. You know. Not good at all. Why don't you get another job? Are you there? I have. I've been there almost 28 years. No. You're there 28. Can you go to another department? Yeah, I could. I could. That could that could be something I could do. Oh, you need to. You you if if see the fact that you're praying though, and the fact that you you tried you tried to ask for forgiveness. Or you receive, you told him you're sorry. Now your duty is done, and <clears throat> now you may have this hatred in your heart. But see, this is where you need to go to Jesus and look at your scriptures. How did Jesus act when they did so much unfair, hateful, mean things to him? He forgave. In fact, he even excused. I would suggest. And when you say it could be physical, that's a very serious kind of hatred. You cannot go to bed with that on your heart. You need to go to the company and say, I would like a change. This man and I cannot get along. I'm afraid something very terrible is going to happen one day. And I'll take a job even if it's lower pay. I just have to get away to save my soul. You need to do that. And keep praying for the man. And give that hatred. Say, Jesus, take away this hatred. But see, you're keeping yourself in a position that you can't handle. That, that's not the right thing to do. It's like an alcoholic going to cocktail parties every night. Well, what do you expect, for goodness sakes? He, he may not drink the first two or three nights, but I'll make a bet by Sunday night he's crocked. <laughs> so you, you put yourself in a very bad position that you could get out of. Please go to another department. Have peace of mind in your heart. And don't allow that person to occupy your mind from morning till night. And then go to confession. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother. How are you? Oh, fine. Where are you from? I am from Cleveland, Ohio. Wonderful. My home state. And what can I do for you? You're talking about difficult parables in the Bible. Yeah. And in, in two of the Gospels, there's the story where Jesus walks past the fig tree. Mm-hmm. And we're told the fig tree is not in season. Right. He's hungry and wants some figs. Mm -hmm. And since there are no figs, he curses the tree and it dies. Yeah, next day. And that's difficult for me to understand. Yeah. Okay. It was difficult for the apostles, if you remember. Next day they went over and that tree was, was a shrub. And they said, Master, look at the tree you cursed. Now, what did that parable mean? That parable meant that we must bear fruit in season and out of season. There's no excuse. The grace, that we used to call it actual grace. It's still actual grace. This man who just called, you see, he has to bear fruit out of season. He, he hates this guy, and the guy hates him, but he's got to bear fruit. He's got to forgive, 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 and pray for him. Get out of that situation. Our dear Lord, you know, a lot of people today, and I'm not saying some people are right, but we blame our relatives and our family. Oh, I had a terrible childhood. Well, what does that mean? You had a terrible childhood. But they use that experience to excuse their hot temper, their hatred. That is past. It's gone. You're an adult now. You got your own mind, your own family, your own way. You cannot keep your, you can't hold this crutch. Somebody made me do this. Oh, come on. 
you got a will and you made yourself do that. See, why not our dear Lord cursed that he did it for a reason. He wanted us to understand. Oh, I got a headache. Why are you so grouchy? I got a headache. That's an excuse to be grouchy? Take some Tylenol or something. Why are you so irritable? I'm fasting today. Well, go eat a hot dog. <laughs> you know, if fasting makes you irritable, go and eat. Who wants to live with you? <laughs> oh, my father is not bearable. Why? He stopped smoking. <sighs> if you're stupid enough to smoke, it's better. Now I'm going to say something nobody's going to like. Go take a smoke, get cancer in your lungs, and then maybe you'll c calm down. See, we do, we do senseless things. Some people are in situations, and I know I was one of them. Misfortune is a part of their life. That is not an excuse. You're out of season. You don't feel good. But you still have to be loving and kind. Somebody is terribly unjust to you. You can't be unjust to someone else. In season and out of season means whether I feel consoled by God or I feel abandoned by God. I am still called to what? Bear fruit. I am still called to bear fruit. If it's a cross, I must bear it patiently. If it's a joy, I must be grateful. If someone does me a grave injustice, then I have to bear that too. God will, must be my life your life. So what our dear Lord is saying, he bore fruit in season, healing the sick and the blind, and he bore fruit out of season. Hanging on a cross, what did he do? He forgave and excused them. In season, out of season. We have another call. Hello? Hi. Hi, where are you from? Uh, New Jersey. And what can I do for you? Um, I have a 15-year-old son who's giving me a lot of trouble. He won't go to church. He won't go to confession. And I would just like to know how to deal with him. I'm a single mom, and I'm going through a pretty nasty divorce. Mm. Well, I know what that is. Many times our children are not taught right in, in, in school. Maybe they're not even taught right in their catechism. They don't know Jesus loves them. They don't understand sin. They don't, he may be angry because of the divorce. You must bear fruit now, not only the trauma, the trauma of a divorce, but the trauma of a son who's not doing what he should. That's a double header, you know. That's a real heavy cross for you. Before God, it's important that you bear with him, that you love him, but you give him good example, that you advise him, tell him where he's wrong. The worst thing in the world is not to correct your children. Correct him, but lovingly and with that knowledge, he may not hear you, not nagging, just every so often, son, this, you're going to get in trouble doing this. You're going to have to love your father no matter what. You concentrate on being the one example. And even if he doesn't listen now, one day he will remember. If you pray with all your heart and trust in the Lord, your son needs grace. He needs light. You can't give him those things. Only God can give it to him. Pray to Our Lady. 
And, and I feel that you'll get an answer to your prayers, maybe sooner than you think. Just don't lose heart, you know. It's a, it's a hard thing, no, no question. You have to be a child of divorced parent to understand. I understand. So you be the example. Give him to Jesus and go before the Blessed Sacrament sometime and say, Lord, I, I'm helpless. I don't know what to do. I give you my son. From then on, be sure you're the example. And we'll pray for you. The sisters and I will pray for you. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother Angelica. Hello. Where are you from? I'm calling from Rhode Island. And what is your question? Well, um, it, I'll just sum it up real quick. Seven years ago, I was a victim of a violent crime just weeks prior to my preparing to spend time with a religious congregation of sisters. Uh -huh. And the crime was so heinous that I abandoned the Lord and the church for many years. But I thank God I recently came back. Thank and you, I Jesus. did it all the right way. I watched your program faithfully and not thank only watched you, but I listened <laughs> and I acted upon all your advice and I went to confession regularly. I sought a spiritual director and I'm now preparing to go and spend a weekend with the sisters um, who I was supposed to go with seven years ago. And Wonderful. Praise God, despite the fact I still have a disability from my injuries and it's not really their policy. They're, they told me that you know, they're still interested in meeting with me and um, you know, and they love me and they want me to come and see and that's what I'm preparing to do. Wonderful. So I'm just wondering if you could give me any advice on different things that I should do the rest of this week to prepare for the weekend. I would just pray, honey, and have joy in your heart that you've come home. The most wonderful gift in the world is to come home. God is your home. You know, the Lord is your home. Heaven is your real home. This is our testing ground, that's what it is. And, and we're all geared, we were created by God to be with God. And it's so important that I say yes to God in everything. And I think you should be prepared to, to look at this as a new opportunity, as a new life, hoping we will pray that they accept you and that you can live religious life. But go in with a purpose to always accept and to accomplish the awesome will of God. And let him guide, and, and he will guide you. He will guide you. Thank him that you were able to forgive and forget this person who injured you so badly and, and be happy again. That's a great grace from God. People take years and years and years and years to forgive something that bad that injures you. So I would, I would just prepare by saying, just enjoying the fact that you're going to have this weekend. And say, Jesus, give me all I need all I need to, to accept this way of life and to live it well. And I know our dear Lord will bless you. He's already blessed you. Huh? We have another call. Hello? Mother? Hey. How where, are you tonight? Where are you from, dear? Uh, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Uh huh. God bless you. I enjoy your show. For the, for the brief time I began to see it, I love it very much. Thank you. You're welcome, Mother. Mother, here's my question. I'm mm -hmm. the youngest of four children. Mm -hmm. I'm not a kid. I'm 44, but I still am a kid at heart. Yeah. But, uh, but the uh, the question I have is that uh, I haven't spoken to my brother in about 15 years, mm -hmm. and uh, it was kind of a family breakup when my father had passed away. He had a big business, and um, not to sound like the righteous one because we all have uh, sin, but I'm kind of the kind of guy who's discovered Christ at a very young age. Well, for the right reason, I guess, I've always forgi forgiven very easily, and I forgive in a second. Yeah. Anybody and anything, just about. But with my family, the problems with my brother is that money got in the way. And um, if I may say this, which is a little harsh, but it's a reality in this world that we're living in that I've learned, is that the evil one, who's in each one of us, and it's just a matter of who we decide to, to, you know, to do, uh, rule with or to go with, constantly, which is an everyday battle for all people, 
Um, he basically is, uh, the greed had overwhelmed him with money. So we haven't really spoken, and I wanted to make the first move to contact him, maybe to send him a letter or call him. Do, does, does he live near you? Uh, no, he lives uh, not far away, about an hour, I would say, by and, drive. And, and, and he has a lot of money, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, 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 that was the thing. The, the split was really over the money. Greed grabbed him, and yeah. he felt that was uh, kind of a threat because it was a business altogether. I just went off on my own and did my own thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we have families 15 years later. We both have our own worlds. But I can't see leaving this world without making the attempt to well, what uh, I, you know, lay what the I, sword down. Yeah, what I would do is write him a real nice letter. And just say, you know, we, we haven't spoken all this time. And and I, I, I just don't think it's, it's good for us. I don't think it's pleasing to the Lord. And I just want you to know that I would, I would like to forgive and forget, and I pray that you also forgive and forget. And I just wonder if you could come over and, and see us sometime, or maybe me and the family could come over and see you. It's been so many years. No. After that, <clears throat> you're right with God. So you made that attempt. Now, wonder if he doesn't answer at all. Well, that's okay. It's okay for you. It's not okay for him. If he writes and tells you, hey, get out of my life, well, then pray and say a prayer for him right away. Say, dear Jesus, I tried, but he's not ready. And because he's not ready, I don't know what else to do. <coughs> We've done pretty good so far, haven't we? Hmm? I need some more water, please. Anyway, if he doesn't accept your forgiveness, then say a prayer for him immediately. Here, they know I need water. I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> Thank you. People have to go under cameras and, and go like this every time I need water, see, but they don't want you to know I'm getting water. But. <laughs> <laughs> and it is water. <laughs> but see, yeah, that, it's okay. You wouldn't want it to be okay, but you should be at peace after that. Just be at peace. And if he says, hey, I've been waiting for a letter. I've thought of it myself, but I didn't have the guts. Now that could be wonderful. Go like nothing happened. See? Give each other a big hug, hug and Bring your family there and have a good time. One of these things for sure is going to happen. Be ready to accept anything. If it's negative, say, Jesus, forgive him. And, well, you're okay with God. So, thank you. I want to thank all of you this evening for being so generous. I do appreciate it. Uh, we're going to have a, a big direct TV in Europe in another couple of weeks uh, where we will reach thousands and thousands of people. And this was a big grace from the Lord, and I shall thank you forever. Your help and your, your encouragement uh, and your funds, your donations have helped. You built this for Jesus, and Jesus is going to bless every one of you. All of you that give every month, please keep at it. Because I feel time is getting short. Oh, I don't mean the world's going to fall apart. It's already falling apart. <laughs> I mean, it's going down fast. I just feel our dear Lord, who loves us so much, is going to do something. Don't have to be drastic. Doesn't have, the world doesn't have to come to an end. God can do what he wants, when he wants, how he wants. But thank you. And keep it up. It takes a lot to go around the whole world 24 hours a day. But this is the greatest evangelistic tool that I think God has give or given us. That we can reach people in jungles, in deserts, on mountaintops, in crowded cities, in apartments, in hospitals, and 
Navy ships and army forts, and we can reach people that live in caves yet, that we can reach the whole world and say, Jesus is Lord, and he loves you. What a gift God has given us. And so please be generous, continue to be generous, because together, we shall present the world to Jesus and say, Lord, here it is. God bless you.